tonight, we're broadcasting live from Peacock Alley. And tonight in Peacock Alley, it's BAM Mondays, which is $1 off for their BAM mug, which I guess we don't talk what that stands for, but it's a big mug. Well, we talk about what it stands for, just not all of it. Okay, so big mug. It means big mug, and the A stands for something, and we'll let everyone fill that in. Okay. So do you have a busy day today, though? Oh, so yes. what are some, give, us, give us a couple, three, four minutes before we get to our guest this evening. I know you've got a, a, a busy night ahead of us, but what, what happened today in the, in the Capitol? Well, since we're in the bar, let's start with bars opening on Sunday and earlier than they normally do. Right now, if, you, if, you're, a, if you're a bar in North Dakota, you can open at noon with the rest of the businesses on, according to our Sunday closing law. Well, there's, a, there's legislation in. It was uh, heard by the House uh, Industry, Business, and Labor Committee this afternoon to allow the bars to open at 10 a.m. on Sunday, just in time for the start, I imagine, of all the football pregame shows. And I'm sure that if this was in effect right now, um, the barkeepers that uh, cater to the Super Bowl crowd would be quite enthusiastic about it because they could uh, sell another two hours worth of uh, worth of uh, libations. Cheers. And uh, there's a there was a bill in House Judiciary. It's somewhat obscure, but I think it's an important subject. It uh, it says there's a special would be a special election required to fill a vacancy in the legislature unless the vacancy occurred during the legislative session. There's been a number of instances in recent years where uh, legislators have resigned uh, or you know, become incapacitated. Uh, mostly it's resigned. And they have someone appointed to take their place, and that person will serve during the legislative session without being elected. Uh. And that, that rubs some people the wrong way. I mean, this, this happened... This got started back in uh, 1997 when the Speaker of the House uh, at the time, his name is uh, Clarence Martin. He, uh, I, I, actually, he was, I don't think he was the Speaker then, but he, he was a, Clarence Martin was his name, and he uh, died during the session. And, uh, and he was a very well-liked man, and everyone took that occasion to, to say, okay, when you have a vacancy in the legislature during the session, what can you do to make sure that the district doesn't go un unrepresented for the rest of the session? So some legislation was hash hashed out to have an appointment process, and that's what's done right now. Uh, and there's some, frankly, some disquiet about the idea of, of a legislator serving who has not been elected unless it's extremely rare circumstances, such as a death uh, during the session, which is what happened in, in Clarence Martin's case. And uh, there's, there's a, a, a bill in to uh, change how that is done. Uh, there's been a number of property tax bills uh, today, tax bills generally, that we're, we're going to be talking about some of those uh, uh, this evening. One of them would reduce the uh, sales tax rate from 5% uh, to 4%. That's being introduced by uh, Representative Rick Becker. He's a Republican from, my, from uh, Bismarck. There's also a bill introduced by a new uh, senator from Fargo, George Sinner, uh, the son of the former governor, and it would uh, exempt clothing from uh, North Dakota sales tax. In fact, one of our guests this evening, uh, uh, Representative Wes Belter, the chairman of the House Finance and Tax Committee, he introduced a, uh, an identical bill uh, recently, and it did not succeed. Um, and this was in a previous session, of course. Um, what really brought people into the Capitol today was a bill that says all school districts must include a high school. This is kind of a hardy perennial that grows up uh, in every session. The logic of it is is that if you have a school district that you should support a high school with your property taxes. There are a number of districts in North Dakota that just support uh, kindergarten through eighth grade or kindergarten through sixth grade, and then they... Uh, tuition their students out uh, to another high school, to a high school. And there's uh, a feeling amongst, primarily amongst uh, uh, urban legislators that this is not a fair arrangement, that uh, these kinds of districts um, don't pay their fair share of supporting a high school. Now there's quite a bit of, quite a big argument about that. But anyway, there's this bill every year, every other year I should say, that says you shall have a high school in your school district or else your district will have to uh, merge with another district or will have to dissolve. And this brings in folks that like their elementary and middle school districts and, and they, they look at this as kind of a, 
a toothache that won't go away. I mean, every two years that this bill gets introduced and it gets defeated and then it comes back and it's just a, a, a big pain for everyone. Is this rural versus city yes. issue more so, Dale? That's yeah, what you're I, saying. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. primarily, yes. And, uh, I mean, there are some situations where it's, uh, you know, all of, most of these, in fact, I think all of these districts, these smaller K through eight districts, they are I, they could be fairly described as rural districts, uh, and they're s typically just outside a city, and and they like Williston has one, and Bismarck has one. There's there's several of them. There's dozens of them. Not maybe not dozens, but there's more than a few. And um, and anyway, this bill brings in the folks that are supporters of these districts and basically say we provide a good education for our kids and we don't think that we're shortchanging anyone in terms of supporting a high school and why is it that you people are always on our backs wanting to get rid of our school districts I see. and uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, debate we wanted to speak to a couple of gentlemen this evening who are experts on the subject of property taxation or taxation generally and property taxation in particular uh, we have uh, representative West Belter He's a uh, chairman of the House Finance and Taxation Committee. He's a former majority leader of the, a Republican majority leader in the North Dakota House. He uh, served in the 2001 session as majority leader just after uh, John Dorso uh, left the House. And he's been, when he was a majority leader, as far as I can remember, he's been the chairman of finance and tax. So he's quite uh, familiar with the subjects that we're going to be discussing this evening. Also, we have Senator Jim Dotsonrod. He's a Democrat from Winemere. Senator Dotsonrod is on the Senate Finance and Tax Committee. And back uh, in the days, and, and these days did exist for, <laughs> for uh, folks that uh, might be doubtful about this, there was a time, believe it, and it wasn't that recently because I'm not like 100 years old or anything, but there was a time in the 80s and 90s that the Democratic Party had control of the Senate and the governorship, and things were politically were quite a bit different than they are now. And at this time, uh, Senator Dotsonrod was the chairman of the How the Senate Finance Tax Committee, and also uh, the chairman of the Political Subdivisions Committee. Okay. And uh, so we have two gentlemen here who are very well qualified to talk about property taxes and taxes of all kinds. And what I wanted to start with was. Uh, Senator Dotsonrod has a bill that uh, essentially would forgive, I think it's the first uh, $4,500 of taxable valuation uh, from property tax. What this, would have the, what this would have the effect of doing is it would exempt a large portion of the property value of a home from property tax. And the state would uh, make up the difference to local governments. And this, uh, it carries a fairly significant price tag, actually. Uh, and we'll get into that in a moment. But Senator Dotsonrod, please describe what your bill's intended to do and what the strategy is here. Well, th the bill has three sections, and the first, sections, first section applies to a residential property and provides a, a reduction of, uh, of uh, it's $100,000 of value off the, the first $100,000 of value of that home. There's a provision in there that says the most that any one taxpayer can get is 80% of that because the feeling is that there should always be some residual tax on, on a home of some kind, uh, even though it may be small, there should be some. So we leave that 20% uh, of the first 100000 on there, and that is uh, the reason is we feel that there should be some connection between the local boards, the school boards, the city council, the park board, whatever whatever. Uh, taxing districts are affected by the taxes on that house and this is the this bill that came out of the interim committee and my, mine does not mine is a separate bill but the one that came out of the interim committee did that it did uh, retain that residual value and there's a, there's a concern that if we get too many homes that have zero tax that that there's going to be a, a, a lack of interest on the part of the homeowners about what the spending levels are but set by the city council or the uh, local taxing district board. So that that's kept on there. And uh, that does reduce the, f the fiscal effect of the bill because you can't get that full 100000 You can only get up to a maximum of 80% of that or, or $80,000. The second part of the bill applies that same dollar amount 
to the uh, to the farmland that would be uh, uh, farmed and owned and, and taxes due on that is farmed by a farmer living in a in a resident that is not subject to property tax. So there, and then the third part of it is a renter's income tax credit that allows them a certain amount of credit on their income tax um, based on 15% of their monthly rent with a cap, an annual maximum of eight of $900 in credit, which would be uh, $75 a month. So those are the three parts of the bill, and the, the theory and the idea behind the bill is to try to find some way to get property tax relief spread out over a fairly a large, wide group of people that represent families that, that live here, that are residents here. Uh, you know, the current buy-down we have on the mill levies does, a certain share of that does go to out-of-state interests. So that's where this bill came from. We've been speaking this evening to Senator Jim Dotsonrod, of a Democrat from Winemere. He's a member of the Senate Finance and Tax Committee and a former chairman of the Senate Finance and Tax Committee. And we've also been speaking this evening to uh, Representative Wes Belter, the chairman of the House Finance and Taxation Committee and a former uh, House Republican majority leader. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you. No, you bet. Thanks. This is Gary Emineth and Dale Wetzel broadcasting live from Peacock Alley, the legislature today. <laughs> we come back from the break. We're going to begin um, talking about the oil tax and breaks that we're looking at coming out of the press conference came today from the Republican leadership. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to Peacock Alley. Gary Emmonth here with your host, Dale Wetzel. We're in the legislature today talking about a lot of things that happen at the legislature today. And Dale, today was a press conference by Republican leaderships and um, dealing with um, oil tax. And I think that's the segment that you're going to be addressing some of those subject matters this evening. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take it away. These are important matters to the state and big funding. Yes, we have uh, we have with us uh, Senator Dwight Cook, who is the chair, the chairman of the Senate Finance and Taxation Committee, and he's also the primary sponsor of the bill that you just mentioned to restructure the North Dakota oil tax and eventually lower the top tax rate from 11.5% to 9.5%. We also have uh, Senator Connie Triplett. She is a Democrat from Grand Forks. She's a member of the Senate Finance and Tax Committee, which will be reviewing this um, this measure. Uh, just to give the most basic summary of it, it, it restructures uh, North Dakota's oil tax and lowers the top rate beginning in J January of 2017 from 11.5% to 9.5%. Uh, Senator Cook, uh, I'm sure that uh, that is uh, going to be a, frankly, a principal uh, criticism of of this bill in that uh, oil, it, it proposes eventually to reduce the tax rate for oil production in North Dakota at a time when oil production is, is booming under the present uh, tax structure. And could you just discuss why you think that this is necessary? Well, first off, uh, Dale, uh, thank you for having me here tonight. And uh, I think considering the statement that you just made, uh, they should really like this piece of legislation. Uh, uh, the bill does some things immediately, and then, of course, it uh, does some other things in 2017. Uh, there'll be almost two and a half sessions that can happen before 2017. Uh, we're all concerned about the oil industry. We're, we've become pretty well addicted to this revenue, but we've got to understand just how volatile this industry is. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, can certainly affect this industry, affect the revenue stream in the North Dakota, and, and so many of these things that can have a tremendous effect on it, uh, we're not in control of. Uh, so uh, it's a volatile industry. It's a tough time to make decisions. So the bill's doing some things uh, immediately July 1st, 2013. Uh, we're fixing the property, uh, stripper well property exemption. Uh, that's going to cost, uh, that'll be an $83 million tax increase on the oil industry. Uh, I don't think the right time, or now is the right time to increase taxes on the oil industry. Uh, so we've put some other things in the bill to try to uh, minimize the effect of that tax increase and uh, we got another stripper well uh, or another uh, exemption available for wells outside of the Bakken and the Three Forks. Uh, we've uh, changed the definition of stripper wells from 30 barrels for the deepest wells to 45 the threshold and uh, so it's 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 going to end up being a 28 million dollar tax increase this biennium and then in 2017 of course the, the tax rate goes down but what the oil industry is giving up and what we all have to understand 
is all of these other incentives that we have out here that are tied to a trigger price. Uh, I think that price right now is about $53.20. And, uh, you know, who can predict what this industry is going to be like in 2017? Who can predict what the price of oil is going to be like? But if these triggers kick in, uh, if that oil goes down to that price again, that could cost the state $2.1 billion. So uh, uh, they're giving up a lot. Uh, I don't look at this as a, a tax decrease. Uh, we're trying to just bring some stability and predictability to the oil industry so we can all make some wise decisions. Senator Triplett, what do you think of that analysis? Well, you know, I, I start from the place where I start on a lot of bills in the tax and in the finance and tax committee, which is that our legislature has a flawed system of analyzing uh, um, the, the, the fiscal cost of bills. As you know, that um, legislative council is required to provide us a fiscal note on each bill that has some fiscal impact. And so I think that what Senator Cook has described for you is an, an accurate reflection of the fiscal impact of the current bill for the upcoming biennium. But by putting off the tax reduction to 2017, uh, we don't even ask our fiscal analysts in legislative council to tell us what the real costs will be over time. And I think just um, a very conservative analysis um, would suggest that we are looking at giving up billions and billions and billions of dollars over the next 40 years by this reduction. So um, granted, um, Senator Cook is correct that the oil industry is giving up something by giving up the exemptions that are in place for them should oil prices drop again. But they are asking, or Senator Cook is asking, the people of North Dakota to give up billions of dollars in revenue over the, over the next generation. i um, got a question for you related to the extraction tax. That's 6.5%. So because of the way they're doing the Bakken wells, so because they got one down and now because it might be going 90 degrees different direction, is there a certain size of where that um, stripper well is protected? In other words, is it like in 40 acres, 80 acres because yeah. of the direction they go out? And that's some for our listeners out there. Now, we may all kind of understand it, but they're trying to get a handle at 6.5%. That, that's a lot of money, obviously, that the oil companies aren't paying. But, but the development of the Bakken is going to be many wells on what these low producing areas are. And that's the exemption sure. you're specifically talking, is right. that correct? And the, the stripper well property, as Senator Cook accurately stated, was was developed by the legislature as an incentive in the days of the vertical wells when there were a lot of dry holes and it was an, an attempt to encourage the oil industry to come back to those areas and try again to, to find oil in what had been a, a dry a, a dry hole. And so th those were typically 40 acre spacings as you mentioned. Now with the horizontal um, drilling, the, the spacings are typically 1280s, which is two full sections of land. Sometimes they're twice that and, and even three or four times that. And so Whatever the unit is defined as, you know, by the by the oil and gas division and the, and the industrial commission, that's the unit we're talking about. So, if you drill one well um, in uh, a 1280, for example, and then let it sit until it declines down to stripper well status, then you come back in and drill eight more wells, and they all come in at a thousand barrels a day. They would all be stripper wells by the way the stripper well property is. So, I think uh, Senator Cook and I are in complete agreement that that is a a, an exemption that has to go. It was designed for the days of vertical drilling when, when finding the oil was not guaranteed by any means. And now we're drilling at virtually 100% as long as people stay inside the, the outer limits of the Bakken. Senator and Cook, related to the bill, are there additional provisions that these incentives that go in place in 2017, are there additional things that... Um, are important outside of this extraction tax of these stripper wells. What are some of the other additional parts well, of the measure? Besides, the, is it flat to stay at nine and a half percent? Is that kind of a permanent fixed number as opposed to the variable of the of the um, production uh, of the the price of oil in the market? It, it'll stay at nine and a half percent, but there are other ten ten other incentives that are going away in 2017, and just the easiest way to explain these incentives is to show how, what it does in the real world. Uh, Senator Triplett talks about the taxpayers' money, but this is what I talk about when we want to bring stability. And the listeners can't see this, but I have a chart in front of me that shows what our effective tax rate has been for the last, since 2000, since the last 12 years I have it here. 
And it goes all over the place, but you can see that we have had many years where the effective tax rate was down around 7%. And then it started coming up as these incentives kicked out. And we've had a nice increase now for the last three or four years that is bringing it close to 11%. I mean, we may have a 11.5% total tax. That's the most a tax that any well is going to pay. But some are paying 115 Some are only paying 5 So we end up with an effective rate. This effective rate could go down to 7% again real quick. It could go down real quick. And that's what it is that I am trying to stop from happening. I want to bring some predictability in here. Just get a steady rate. Uh, I think if you average this out, you might find that we're below 9.5% over the last 12 years. And, and it's, it's a complicated tax rate. We've, we've, we've done it to ourselves. And we ourselves now have got to fix it. Uh, we've introduced a bill today that I think uh, is the place to start. Uh, Senator Triplett and I are both on the tax committee. Uh, I chair it. It's our responsibility uh, to solve this issue. Uh, we're going to sit here and have a lot of discussions during the next few months. Ultimately, I believe, and Senator Triplett will agree, that I think something's going to go to the governor because a strip of property fish fix has got to be taken place of. Competition with other states that have shale rock formations. I mean, what are their tax rates? Is, is that an important factor in the argument over whether North Dakota should uh, restructure its uh, oil taxes? Well, I think uh, the oil industry, of course, is a very uh, capital-intensive industry. It, it's, uh, it's a lot of investment. They're all going to look at where they can get the best return on that investment. And if they think that uh, they can get it better somewhere else, that's where they're going to go. I think as far as our tax rates go, uh, if you look at our tax rate on oil, I think you're going to say that we're probably on the high side. I think if you look at all the taxes that uh, get imposed on the industry from state to state, uh, I think we're the only state that doesn't impose a property tax, does, does not impose a property tax. Uh, so I think and we ultimately end up probably in the middle of the pack out there. But uh, it also costs a lot of money to bring that barrel of oil to the ground out here in North Dakota. we got winners. Texas does not. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it, they, they're going to look at what it costs to bring a barrel of oil to the ground. And, and we do have competition. We invented shell or drilling in the shell here. They're all using it now. One of the things that both of you would be familiar with is that a, a bill similar to this, although certainly not identical, but it's similar to this, was brought up uh, two years ago by the House Majority Leader, Al Carlson. Now, it had some graduated taxes depending on production, but it, it had some, I think it's fair to say it has some similar aspects to what uh, Senator Cook's uh, new legislation is. And at that time, that bill was not taken up. It was, meh. Yeah, it was, and there were a number of factors I imagine that both of you could discuss. But what is so, if it wasn't a good idea two years ago, what makes it a good idea now? You'll have to ask Senator <laughs> Cook. <laughs> uh, it's all about timing. Uh, two years ago when that bill came in, it was after crossover. It was amendments to uh, uh, a House bill that we had in the Senate. Uh, if we would have put it on, we would have never had a hearing on that bill. We'd have never been able to take input from the public. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, this bill now that is introduced at the beginning will get four hearings, one in the Senate tax, one in the Senate appropriations, and then the same thing in the House. The other thing is we didn't two years ago know the size of this oil industry. Uh, the rig count was still going up. We did not. Production was still going up. We now have answers to that. Uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen it level off. We've seen the rig count start to go down. We know where the Bakken is. Uh, we just had our first month of decreased in oil production. So uh, we, we know a lot more than we did two years. And a lot of times with legislation, finding a solution to a problem, timing is everything. Senator Triplett, do you um, think that is, it was it a matter of timing two years ago or is it because it's a flawed idea? No, I think Senator uh, Cook is correct that it um, the, the idea didn't really gel until after crossover. And so the it, you know, I think everybody was concerned that it that a, a major change like this should have proper hearings. So I think that was why there was reluctance on the part of, of, of um, everyone in the, in the legislature to, to bring it up. Um, I, I'd like to respond, if I could, to the, the notion about comp competition with other states. I, I think that was more of a, of a concern you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when, when, when we had oil booms in the past. And there was really very little expertise inside the state of North Dakota in terms of, of knowing how to drill an oil well. Um, in, in this go-round, we've got a fair number of, of homegrown oil men who have 
figured out how to how to drill the Bakken. And, and so even if the major companies who have assets in other states decide to pick up and, and leave, I think that the void would be filled by our local folks who um, who have no assets, as they refer to them in the oil industry, in other states. And so I'm not as concerned about competition as I as I would have been if we if that hadn't happened. So you know I think um, we we owe something to our to our local folks who have figured out how to play in this industry, and and that will keep us going no matter what happens um, um, in in other states. Now, obviously, as Senator Cook said, the the world price of oil collapsing would obviously hit everyone. But but if it's just a matter of the the major companies deciding to take their rigs and go play somewhere else, I think we have people here who would continue the, the industry. You, you raise a point that I wanted to, to raise with, with, with both of you. Our ta- is taxes, our taxes and a state's tax structure really that important? And is it just, frankly, a function of the oil price? I mean, as long as a state's taxes are not exorbitant, which I, I don't think that anyone would argue that North Dakota's taxes or exorbitant on the oil industry, D- isn't price everything. I mean, ta- taxes yeah. almost don't matter. I mean, yeah, if, I if, if the price of oil is 100 bucks a barrel, if the tax is questionable, well, people still be piling in looking for, looking for their strike. I would, uh, I would have to argue all you got to do to answer your question is look at Alaska. Alaska. Uh, they drove them out of the state with taxes. So there is a point where taxes do matter. I okay. think the question we can debate is what is the point. All right. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Senator Triplett? Oh, sure. I'm, I'm sure there's a point where you could drive people out, but I think we're a long, long way from that point in North Dakota. We've been speaking this evening with uh, Senator Connie Triplett from uh, Grand Forks. Uh, she's a Democrat, and we've been she's a member of the Finance and Taxation Committee in the North Dakota Senate, and we've been speaking to Senator Dwight Cook, a Republican from Mandan, who is a the chairman of the Senate Finance and Taxation Committee. They're going to be taking up an oil legislation that we've been discussing, which uh, is sponsored by uh, Senator Cook, and it's going to be one of the major uh, bills of the legislature. Coming live from Peacock Alley, this is Gary Eminent and your host, Dale Rutherford. Thanks for listening.